Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on In The Metal. You're very welcome. And uh, we're looking forward to, once again, taking you for uh, an exclusive look behind the scenes of some of the darkest corners of independent watchmaking where people rarely tread. And every week so far, we have been uh, speaking to some of the greatest inventors and creators of watchmaking uh, of our generation and tonight is no exception indeed tonight is actually pretty special very close to my heart because i am um, you may not know based in ireland but based in northern ireland and uh, home of one of the great contemporary watchmaking inventors innovators of our time uh, and we're going to be going direct from where I live here in Warren Point to Belfast, uh, which is about 50 kilometers up the road. And uh, we're going to be talking to this uh, absolutely great guy tonight. So time is of an essence. I'm not going to uh, hold on any longer. So um, to uh, as ever, uh, we are joined from uh, North Carolina by the great and wonderful Dan Spitz, US master independent watchmaker in the process of creating his own timepiece at the minute and also formerly lead guitarist with Anthrax, that 30 million album selling, three times Grammy nominated, hell racing, hard rocking, kick ass trash metal band. And Dan is joining us tonight. So, what is the story in North Carolina, my man? We're having a metal fest here, dude. There's like 50,000 people in my backyard. Yo, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's where they all are. What? <laughs> There's nobody out and about around here, my mom. I, des I decided to pick up my guitar and play, and the earth shook one more time. Wow. Some night you're going to do it. I know. Some night you are going to do it because I've got a guy lined up who's going to play along with you. Um, uh, <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. I think I'll shake the earth with my with my with time instead for now. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm Let's see what there, happens. Johnny, man. We're here. I missed your face, uh, but uh, this is something that me and you uh, have been talking about for a long time. And, Without uh, a doubt. Yeah, yeah um, we've look, we've been uh, talking about the how, how we're, what we're doing, what direction we're going in, and who we'd like to talk to. And I can tell you, the, our guest tonight is a gentleman called Stephen McDonald. Stephen McDonald is the, I, I described him earlier on in my social media post as MBNF's secret weapon. Mm -hmm. He is the man who has recreated the perpetual calendar, which is a classic complication originally, I think in, from the mid 17th century by Thomas Mudge. Mm -hmm. uh, upgraded and uh, installed in a wristwatch by Patek Philippe in the 1920s. And basically, like a lot of horological innovations, fundamentally unchanged until Stephen McDonald came along. And he has completely refined this classical uh, complication, haute complication, grand complication, and just get, giving it a completely new persona, but, new personality. But the best part is what people have to understand is, is we'll get to the, the genius part of, of Stephen because that, that's what he is, is the understatement and the reclusiveness, the elusiveness, as, as I've written. Um, uh, there is almost no articles or anything you can Google away until your heart's content to, uh, regarding him. There's no pictures of Stephen's workshops online. There is nothing. He's like the hidden... You know, a rock star dude. You know, who's the um, is the he's the writer of the all the hit songs for all the biggest artists. That he is, but, yes. he, but you know, you know, his name is not in the forefront because he's he's happy where he is. You know, and totally. uh, but now today we're gonna blow him his cover. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. So, oh, here I'm so looking forward to this, and we have so much show lined up for you, everyone, because uh, we are. I, I have had a sneak preview at some of the images that are going to be shared live from Belfast City this evening. And this is uh, never before seen stuff and stories that you've never heard before. But let me tell you, this is going to be epic. So do you know what, Dan? We better get over to Belfast here before he decides to change his mind. So too late now. <laughs> 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 
It's absolutely that's absolutely hilarious. I've never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, trying work, I'm trying to work out who it is you're talking about. <laughs> I know you guys all because you're you. reclusive even about yourself. <laughs> I, uh, I, I sometimes, I'm occasionally asked that question. I always re respond that um, I, I'm a big Radiohead fan, you know. And there's this, there's this brilliant song on Kid A, um, which is the one after OK Computer. It's a brilliant song on Kid A called How to Disappear Completely. And yeah. I always, that's, that's my sort of that's my sort of plan for life. You know, there has to be. Fantastic. After we're finished with this interview, everybody has to go and listen to How to Disappear Completely by Radiohead. Okay, that's my only uh, my only proviso is that. Okay. That's th those that that's was on the rider tonight, Dan. That we there had to go. go and listen to Radiohead afterwards. So there you go, man. You got it. That's good. Look, we're starting to sweat off with music already, and it's good music. So. <laughs> good music. Good music. Start. <laughs> okay. Now we know it's even blast at the bench. We know his secret weapon is Radiohead. That's it. That's how he comes up with all this wacky, crazy stuff. Oh, sometimes, yeah. Backwards design, perpetual calendar mechanisms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, listen to kick things off. I better maybe explain to people if you what, what this is a been a, a big week for for you, Stephen, as you were up at the crack of dawn on Monday morning uh, in anticipation of the launch of the new. MBNF Legacy Machine Perpetual Calendar Evo, and how did that go? Well, it's very, it's very exciting. You know, it's 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 a real treat that the thing, you know, it's kind of it's it's gone this far and it's now achieved a sort of a new a new evolution. You know, that it's been re released in a kind of a new format. So it, it, you know, it's very exciting. It's a real privilege to see that something I was kind of involved in. You know, still it's been a it's been a big thing for MBNF, and still people are interested and. Uh, you know, there's enough sort of interest there to, for for, for I mean, to want to, to to you know to do a new version of it. You know, and, and this evil thing is very good because it speaks to a different part of the market. You know, so I I think it's personally I think it's, it looks great. I'm I'm really delighted with it. You know, and the, the team there have done a great job. I mean, it's very much a it's very much a team effort. You know, and there's a lot of guys there who work very hard, very very clever people. You know, so I I, I think it's I'm really chuffed. It's very exciting. You know, very exciting. It's great. Thanks incredible like you're chuffed i'm fit, sitting up the road here from you and i am bursting with pride that this extraordinary creation is uh is made in the shadow of the uh the cranes down in, in horn the wolf shipyard where famous oh, titanic was uh was, uh was created and uh oh, wow i didn't know that oh, man, killer, man. Man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can yeah. see the nearly see the, the horn the wolf cranes you can nearly see from my house you know so i mean it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I'm very proud. I'm very proud of where I'm from. You know, Belfast. Belfast is a completely different place now. But a hundred years ago, Belfast was like one of the most important industrial cities in the world. You know, he had the biggest shipyards, the biggest rope works, the biggest tech, textile industry. Belfast was all about making stuff. Yeah. You know, it, and, yeah. and uh, my father no, worked I, all, I, all his life. My father worked in factories and stuff, and he was always making things. And I, I I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm surrounded by making you know so it, it's really intrinsic you come here and you visit and you can go to visit still you can go to the shipyards and you can go to visit the actual dry dock that they built to construct the titanic and it's a museum now and this thing is absolutely vast wow you know, you put your head around how big every, it is. every time i play there Stephen, because i don't know if you know i mean i played belfast many many times yeah, okay. but, but it was it wasn't at a time where we were even allowed to stay in a hotel we, we had to go right back yeah. to dublin yeah. because of, yeah, mean, yeah. Every, everybody was killing each other over there at that yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. unfortunately, I didn't even know that. I wouldn't have been great, you know, because every sorry, I think most sorry. of the times I played there was with Ozzy. So okay. it would be cool, you know, bring Ozzy down to the Titanic. That would, that would, be cool. right, yeah. <laughs> that would have been a lot of fun. It's funny, but it, well, it's changed greatly, you know, because whenever I was I was growing up, even when I was a teenager and stuff, that whole area in Belfast, what used to be the shipyards, you know, it was just it was just a derelict waste ground you know what i mean you could you could go there and wander about on the titanic slipways and it was just there was just nothing there it was just completely derelict now the whole thing is a museum and it's all oh, beautiful wow. and interesting but in those days it was really it was the it was absolutely falling to pieces you know it's funny how it all things i'm very interested in the past you see and it's one of my very many character flaws is that i'm absolutely obsessed with nostalgia and the past and all the sort of stuff interests me and me it's like hugely you know so I've always been digging around, looking at things like that, you know. So you, you grew up in a very industri industrial area, and that's definitely had a, a, an influx on you. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 
Yeah. So just to rewind just a little bit, I don't want to go totally backwards because no. we, once again, me and Johnny, we do ask, you know, some, a little bit of background on, on who we speak to and all that. And sure. for some, some odd reasons, the, the, the crazy, the crazy dudes, uh, like myself, cause I'm definitely a little bit crazy. We, some, most of us end up somehow going straight back to that line of that Wolf Step New Chantel school where I went and where, mm -hmm. where it seems you went. I don't know, what, mm -hmm. can you fill us in what year you went? And I know then that you stayed on then once again uh, to do some teaching and so on and so forth. So if we could maybe take it from there just a little bit. Yeah, well, sure. So I, I you know, growing up in, here in Northern Ireland, I was always, I was absolutely obsessed with watches and clocks and stuff since from over the age of four. When I was four years old, my grandfather gave me this clock that he'd found in his attic. He gave me this clock and that was me completely hooked. I had to take this thing apart and put it back together. And eventually I found a man who could give me the parts to get it working when I was about 10. I was just absolutely obsessed. But there's no culture of watchmaking or anything like that here. So you'd never really, in those days, this is back in the 1980s, so I didn't ever seriously consider that as like a career. I'm not going to follow this path. I knew I would all, it would always be something I would be doing as like an interest or a pastime, you know, but I never thought seriously about it as a career until, uh, you know, much later, until after in my early 20s. You know, so meanwhile, I'd grown up and I'd gone to university and I, I have a degree in theology, you know, mm -hmm. from Oxford University. So I went and did all this kind of stuff. So I always, the watchmaking was always still in my head, but I, I had no way to really, um, you know, I just thought it's something I will have for me. It will be a private thing, a private interest, you know. But so then it, it just didn't go away. And then I realized that I started fixing. I, I finished my degree and, and then all the people I knew who had done the same thing as me at university, they'd all come, they'd all gone and they'd all become merchant bankers and, you know, venture capital analysts and all this kind of stuff. And I came home here and I went on the dole and then, I got a job working for a charity for homeless people, and I was driving the van delivering the second-hand furniture to the people, you know, and it was brilliant, and I had the best time doing that. And then for my 21st birthday, my mother gave me a clock, and I just I started getting friendly with a guy who sold the clock. He was an antique dealer, and then I started repairing his clocks, and then I was repairing other jewelers' work and stuff. But I still had a lot of people wanted clocks fixed, and then I thought, maybe there is something in this. And then, as you say, exactly, the story comes around, as you say, exactly. Then I heard about this what's that thing, what is this watch step thing? So I found out about that, and then uh, at, the two, at the beginning of 2001, January 2001, I headed off to Miss Hotel to, to study at watch step. That was, that was how I got in. That was my way in, really. So did, you my, two, did, did you sign up for the two-year course first? Oh, yeah. No, I didn't, you see, because I, uh, when I went, I had already been working in clocks and stuff for you know some years, although at this point, I was completely self-taught. I'd never had any formal training at all, but I was... And then the school, you saw, I know you saw Stephen McGonagall and John McGonagall a few weeks ago. They both went to the watchmaking school in Dublin. Mm -hmm. But whenever I was at school, they bought the watchmaking school in Dublin advertised themselves so badly that I never knew they existed, you see. So I never had any opportunity to go there. And then by the time I did find out about it, I was sort of too far down the line to start to do a full training course. So I went to Mr. Tell to do the refresher course at the beginning of 2001. And my, pr my plan was go and do this refresher course and then five months and then come back to Belfast and then, I don't know, do whatever sort of stuff. And then, of course, I ended up staying in Switzerland for 13 and a half years. And that's, just, that's how it goes. <laughs> that's great, man. That's so I, 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 I was there and I, I, I did the course and then they, towards the end of the course, Simon offered, Simon proposed that I, I remain and I train to become an instructor in one step. So and, and there's you your name again, uh, Antoine Simon. So he was there when you were there. He is, oh, yeah. he, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, he is, the, it's like Tony Iommi is the godfather of heavy metal. Like, Simonon is the godfather of this, this, the second wave of all of us, you know, that, that, yeah. that brought independent watchmaking to where it is today, where I can see the third, the third wave starting globally now. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, he was it, you know, he let, he let me have free reign, you know, I was there, same mm -hmm. kind of course. And I, you know, I went through the course really fast and then it was, I'm on the complicated side, doing complications. It's not even part of what I'm supposed to be doing. He was just, he pushes you. He, you know, he knows where people belong. It's just an, an amazing dude. Amazing yeah. dude, man. And he influenced, influenced so many of us, man. So many of us. You're right. And a lot, lot of people that are, you're, you're speaking to have all been through Lost Step or had something to do with Lost Step. You know, so it's true. That was it. You know, I went to, I had, 
I've been working in a watch shop in Northern Ireland. There's only two watch shops, one in Belfast and one in Enniskillen, and I was working in the one in Enniskillen in the west of, in the west of Northern Ireland. And so this going to Switzerland was my first formal training. So once I got to Switzerland, my learning curve was like vertical, you know, for like the first, all through that course, it was just like completely everything I wanted to know. I was suddenly being able to find out. It was, I mean, it was just- It's it all was, there, right? It absolutely. It was the, it was the most, it was the most wonderful time of my life. I'll never forget it. It was the most, I lived more intensively in those first two years mm. in Switzerland than I ever have done before or since. And it was, it was, um, you know, we, it, it was incredible. I mean, we really had fun as well. We really partied a lot, but it was, it was in the, the, the knowledge and all the stuff, it was fabulous. So I was there, I did the course and then I stayed on to, to learn to be an instructor. And I was, I worked with Vutlinen for like two years because I was kind of his assistant, first of all, you know, with Carrie Vutlinen. So I was there all the time with him, and you know, you, I, you know, I don't need to say anything about him. You guys know who he is, you know. So, so that was a great opportunity, and then, um, you know, I then stayed on. I became an instructor, and I was then instructing in a complicated, the restoration, complicated watches course, and all that sort of stuff, you know. And I mean, it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. But I did that until the middle of two thousand and seven, and then that was enough because I was never really. Um, I, I think I was never really. Um, I think there's. I also, I also, ta- I also trained a lot of teachers in that time. The teachers from the different lost tech schools would come to Nusatel to learn stuff, and I would talk. I would train them. So, and I think there's two types of people. There's people like Henry Corpola who are born teachers, who are teachers teaching watchmaking, and then there's people like me who are um, watchmaking is my main thing. I, I did teaching for a while. It's grand, but it's it's not my first love. Henry Corpola, his first love was teaching, and that's you ask him that, so he'll tell you. I, 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 I push everybody towards his school because I feel, you know, what he's doing now is basically the school of, of Wolstep that I went to way back when with Antoine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's, just, he's, he's taking that at because yeah. and, and pushed it forward to where yeah. the, new, the new independents are, where, you know, uh, bridge, making bridges and making your own watch, you know, is part of the curriculum. It's, yeah, he's, yeah. He, you're right, though. He's, you could, he's just a teacher teacher. Same, same, cool. same like you. I, I did teaching for Chopard and designed all their courses for complications and for the loop movements and all that. It's not my game, bro. <laughs> it's yeah. not my game. I can do it. Like I, I really enjoyed it and I enjoyed the work. I enjoyed working with the students. You get a huge amount of satisfaction from the, you see how much the students are into it. And that was very enjoyable, but it was never what I was going to do long term. You know, So I was kind of toying with the idea of becoming independent and I was, I kind of, it took me two years to sort of get the, get the nerve together to finally you know, draw the line and, and go and do that. But once I did that, there was there was no looking back. You know, so so uh, that takes us to summer two thousand seven. Summer two thousand seven, I left Lost Step and I became independent. I moved into the I moved into Steve McGowan's workshop, and then Stephen and I shared the workshop for the next seven, seven years. You know, so we we had a big room. You know, we had a big room and then small rooms off the big room. So we shared all the all the main machinery was in the big room and then I had my little room and Stephen had his little room and we had another couple of guys who came and went in, in the meantime, you know. So and that's where I that's where I really started doing doing working in the past. So were you working on his timepieces as well as No 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 we no, we just shared the room. We'd no we no um we had no professional connection at that point at all. We just we just shared the we shared the room and we shared the space and we'd sometimes have a cup of tea together and I would sometimes go and weep quietly. So it was the birth, the birth of, of uh, Ireland's uh, independent watchmaking was was out of Stephen's place. You just because you two guys are just. I guess, I guess, yeah. I mean, you know, Nusha, you know yourself. Nusha tells a small, Nusha tells a small place, and the watchmaking world is a very small place. So it's inevitable that Stephen and I are both living in the same small town. Of course, we're going to meet. You know, that's great. Right, you know, so we are, we are, we're great pals. It show, it show, once again, what I'm trying to show Stephen is, it's, it's. The love, you know, we're we're all behind the scenes, one by oh, one, yeah. and I'm trying to draw more of that out of all of us, as you can see with me and Johnny here. You know, it's yeah, a small, yeah. it's a very small community, and most yeah. of us are very loving people helping each other. Uh, and nowadays, we are letting out, you know, some of the secrets that people used to hold, like, you know, it's my little secret, dude. You know, it's 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 that's not right. really like that anymore. Uh, mo- right. Mostly, mostly, and that's just a wonderful thing, and that's just great. So you, you kind of just push forward. And uh, how did you? How did you just get well, out? the next thing, the next thing really, um, the next thing which was very important, I suppose, was Peter Speak. Peter, Peter's a great. Peter's an old friend of mine as well. And I, whenever I was trying to get the nerve together to do this go independent thing and leave and leave uh, Lost Up, I, I got in touch with Peter Speak. It was actually Steve McGonagall who said to me, "Go and talk to Peter Speak." 
And I did, I went to see him and Peter, you know, Peter sort of said, yeah, you know, do this. And Peter, you know, Peter saw, Peter saw something in me. I don't know what the hell he saw. He saw something. <laughs> he, I don't know. He, he, I don't know. He seemed to think there was something there. And he, I, I, at that time, what I was doing, when I first became independent the first couple of years, I was, I was basically assembling complicated watches. I was working for Clara a bit, and I was also working for Max. That's where I met Max right at the start in HM1, in that whole bit. You know what I mean? When, he, when Max did, when he first did HM1, he'll tell you the story in, all the, in, in better detail than ever you speak to him. But basically, when he did HM1, that was his first watch. Um, MBNF was Max and, and Estelle, who was the lady who helped him. You know, he did all the sort of admin and all this kind of stuff. There were two people in, in MBNF at the start. It was tiny. And, and he'd, been, he'd been hung out to dry by the company who were actually building the watches. He wanted them to supply complete watches. And then all they supplied him with was incomplete kits of a, of, a, of a watch that had never been prototyped. So it had all sorts of faults and problems. And Peter Speak is one of the uh, friends on the first MBNF watch. And so Peter Speak knew me and he knew a few other people. And uh, Max called Peter, I think, and then Peter rang around a few of these watchmaker people like me. And then it ended up that we sort of, we assembled the, we assembled the HM1 watches. We did the, we did the prototype and I found all, we worked out all the problems and remade the parts and got it all to work. And then we were able to start producing these for Max and he was actually able to keep his company together. You know, I think it was wow. very... Touch and go. So that so I met that's when I met Max. That was that just coincided with me becoming independent and so wait a minute. So your theological background has has developed you into a savior. I would say I would say I was coming for coming. I don't have I just I need to just clarify that point. I don't have a religious bone in my body, but I'm just very interested in that that side of life. I'm very, I'm totally fascinated by it. Personally, myself, I'm not, I didn't do it for religious reasons. I did it purely for the, for the. Wow, wow, amazing, amazing. But yeah. so that, that takes us to Max, and that takes us to 2006, seven, that sort of thing. And uh, so I met Peter through this Max project, or I met Max through, through Peter, and we all got involved in working together. And then um, Peter kept saying to me, you know, you need to do, you need to start actually designing stuff and constructing. I was like, I don't do that. That's not a strong thing. I'm never going to do that. I was just assembling watches and, you know, I was a, very much a watchmaker at the bench with the machines, making the parts, doing all that sort of stuff. And Peter kept saying, no, you need to go, and, you know, you need to go and learn CAD and you need to start designing stuff. And I was like, what? So I knew I did. I took three months off work and I got um, uh, 3D CAD software and I took three months off work and I just sat and I taught myself Autodesk Inventor for three months and I did nothing but that. Nobody paid me. But at that time, I had no children and no family, and it wasn't didn't matter, you know. So I, and so I, I'm completely. So I, the, my history in terms of watch design and construction starts then, sort of 2007, 2008. So, so, but, Peter, at, but, but at that time, so you learned CAD, probably SolidWorks or, or, or Fusion 360, or well, I was thinking out back then. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you, you didn't know CAM. And, no, and I don't know any of this stuff. I told I, I'm completely I'm com except for watch step and watch Megan, I'm completely self taught. So I don't know, is that a good thing or a bad thing? But so normally this is the I think if I have if I have anything to bring to the table in watchmaking, it's it's the following. It's that in Switzerland and you guys will know this, in Switzerland you're very there's very much two sides to this aspect of the industry. There's the people who go to watchmaking school who are effectively uh, technical people who do all the bench stuff and they, they're maybe in the industry and after sales or in production or whatever the heck they're doing, they're doing all that stuff. They go to watchmaking school and then you have the people who are the constructors who go and do whatever it is four or five years at, um, at Seafoam or the, you know, the technical, the technical, it's basically, it's an engineer, it's a subset of engineering. So you go to university and you do watch construction, which is a subset of engineering, particularly geared towards watchmaking. So you have these very much practical people and these very much theoretical uh, university people and mm -hmm. the two never meet you know so it, it happens over and over again that you get the stuff that gets designed and it looks absolutely brilliant on the screen but when you come to build it, it it can be it can be less than perfect and vice versa the watch making people don't really communicate enough with the technical people so i i have sort of if i have anything to offer as i say it's that i can kind of i'm on both sides of that fence because i come from watchmaking practical watchmaking tools and benches and machines and so on but I then went to become a constructor. But I'm—I never went to to university. I never went to watchmaking school. So I'm, 
I, I do think I've always done things my own way, be that a good thing or a bad thing. I, I, I don't really know, but I think, I, think I, 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 can, I can imagine how stuff will be. Whenever I design stuff on the screen and, and the, using the 3D software, I can really see in my mind how it's going to, if it's going to behave properly. And that, how it will that, be that, that, that's the difference, because I did exactly what, what, you, what you're talking about. I went to school here to do, well, my development here, because I'm a one man show for CAD and CAM, and I built my own CNC machines from the ground up because. Yeah. I, I just have to understand everything, how it goes to bridge yeah. that gap. And you're absolutely right. In our mind, as as watchmakers at the level that you are at, um, as we're designing in CAD, we see it a completely different way than someone who's just you know schooled that way to make a new watch and everything just fits on a screen. We know the problems because we've seen so many other problems in in, in real life with, with timepieces on our bench. Yeah, and we look right. at it to a totally different uh, analytical way. Uh, than anybody else. We see it as a whole. We see, will it really work? You know, we see 95% of it. We still got to tangibly touch it because I'm a tangible person and then see whatever problems there may be at, truthfully at the bench. But it's not like way off, like when I would get stuff, like even at Chopard, you know, we would development of the of the, the four barrel uh, Luke, you know, it was the same kind of thing. You get it and they would hand it to me for like what you're saying. Tell us longevity wise, what's going to happen to all these parts? Because yeah. we don't know. And that's those people's brains. They can put it together, but they really don't know. So for, yeah. for, for, for collectors who are watching this to try and understand what Stephen said, that's basically it. You know? but there's another observation that we've, we've hit on this before, and that's when uh, people have come on here, Stephen, and they're not classically trained. So they've, they've learned as they go along. They've innovated. They've had to improvise. They've had to do their own problem solving. That it, yeah. There's no textbook. Uh, for that and those are the most individual of watchmakers that you can nearly tell that they're not constrained by convention and that allows a, a freedom of to uh, the, the the courage maybe to explore these uh, innovations and these other directions that they're not in a classical textbook and I think I've noticed that uh, among the people who have come on so far down who have not been classically trained are the ones who are making the most incredible uh, pieces. Yeah, there's, there's something in that. I, I don't know. It's, it's hard to really know at the end of the day. I mean, I, I don't. I don't have the in-depth um, sort of engineering knowledge. Whenever I go to see these guys in Switzerland, I mean, they can make all the, the in-depth analysis of the springs and the you know all of the the, the, the problems with stress and strain and Young's modulus and all this very very technical stuff. And I can do a lot to a certain point. But I don't master it in the way that those guys can do it, you know. But if I design, this, I will know ninety-five percent. If I design a spring, I know by looking at it if it's if it's right or not, you know. If it, and, and, and and I know how it ought to look. Um, if it doesn't look like that, I will I'll know that something's so, not right. You know? that's, but, so, so what I was getting at, Stephen, is the way you work now. Okay, well, let's just fa fast forward just for a minute. The way you work now from your workshop, because I don't know, we, none of us know what's in your workshop, you know. Uh, and obviously, you, you just you just told us you don't know Cam, so there's no. Oh, no, I do. No, I do. I know I do know Cam. Yeah, I do. Oh, I taught do myself. Know. Yeah, I learned. I taught myself CAD, and then I taught myself CAM. I got a CNC milling machine, and um, yeah, so I can sort of do all those things. Yeah. So that's what you're doing. So when you're working with uh, with whatever you're working on, you're actually producing most of the parts uh, right there in in your workshop. It would be it would be a balance. For example, they, we talk. You know, we've talked about the MBNF project. There, I can show you some stuff. I, I've yeah. got, as I mentioned before, I've got some images and some bits and pieces that I worked on before. But generally speaking, with the projects these days, like the professional calendar watch, the movement is like 581 components or something. If I was to make the whole thing here by hand, it would take me like three years, you know, so it's not an option. But what <laughs> I think, in, in, in terms of the prototyping for that watch, what, what we would do with MNF is they would, they would get the majority of the watch made with all their suppliers for the prototyping. And then I will make all the sensitive bits here. I will do the prototyping of the first piece here in my workshop. So I will make all of the sensitive bits, all the springs, all the bits I know are going to be dodgy or problematic. I'll make all those myself, which means that I'm making them here. If there's a problem, I can redesign the spring, re knock it off the machine and have it by lunchtime. Whereas if I have to, if everything has to go back through Switzerland and the suppliers, that'll take, that thing will take three months rather than a, a three hours, you know? So it means that I can be very flexible and very reactive with what I'm doing. But, I, I wouldn't make the whole thing. It would just take far too long. There's no real advantage to do yeah. that. The point, the point is to get to the to, the aim is to get to the point of having a working, completely fully working prototype as quickly as possible. So 
all that me doing all the sensitive bits allows me to do that. So, so you, you're trading CAD files back and forth and then having some parts made wherever they're yeah. made by, by EDM, by CNC, whatever yeah, yeah. they name it. And then they're delivered to your workshop. You're starting basic assembly uh, in a prototyping type fashion and yeah. putting it together when there's problems or hair springs or uh, yeah. retrograde springs and all that you're making there from raw stock. Putting yeah. it together, reporting back to headquarters, change this, change this, change that, send me new parts. And that's kind of the way it's working. Yeah, it kind of goes like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to understand. I don't. I don't. In terms of serious things, I don't make anything here. You know, I don't. I don't produce anything in any sort of volume. I don't make, as you know, I don't make any watches under my own name. I have nothing to sell, so I don't have any. I'm not producing anything in any volume here. All the machinery and equipment I have over there that you can't see is all is all purely for um, it's all purely for prototyping and sort of unique unique pieces. It's not to make. I don't make anything in any sort of volume. You know, so. Okay. So what, what kind of stuff do you have in your workshop? You got obviously you'll have a Shaolin seventy and some other stuff in there. I've got, I've got, I, I can show you the pit. This, I've got the pictures of the old. This is I don't have any pictures of this room, but I've got the pictures of the old workshop in Switzerland, which I can show you. And uh, so this is the workshop I shared with Stephen. And uh, as I said, um, I, I've basically got the same equipment in the workshop I have now as I used to have then. So I can yeah, I can let you take a look at this. So you'll see. I just happen to have these pictures. You see, so that way you get a look at what. What I what was here? Let's do this thing now, Johnny. If we can get this to work, huh? There we go. There we go. So this is this is the. Can you see this? <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's metal, bro. <laughs> this is the, this is very, <laughs> whenever I was leaving, whenever I was leaving Switzerland in two thousand fifth and two thousand fourteen, I took a photograph of this. This is the door of our workshop, and what is so awesome about it is that Stephen had this company called Shit Hot Watches, and you see he coloured in the pop <laughs> with felt tip. Absolutely top class. That's killer, hey, man. Hey. That's so metal, man. Uh, see, so that, that's our door. Okay, so this is the this is the workshop. Oh wow! So it, you know, it's all the usual sort of stuff. It's like you know, Agathon and uh, Shogun Seventy, and that's the CNC machine there at the back, and then the compressor for the CNC machine. This is the machine with the wooden discs for polishing the pinion leaves. Right. You know, and this is the this is a finishing old fat. This is a project. This, is, this isn't working. It's still sitting here. It's still not working. This is a project, a machine for doing the um, the collimassonage on the winding wheels and that sort of thing. Um, Sixus jig borer, um, Hauser jig. Or sorry, Sixus milling machine, Hauser jig borer there, and uh, and this is the this is a really old sapphag machine for sharpening cutters. Um, this is an old sapphag machine for doing wheel and pinion cutting. You know, so that kind of stuff, and then. We move it around. This is the room from the other side. So two showrooms there, profile projector, and that's my wee room in the back. So I have I have I have all the same equipment here now. It's just the room I'm in is a bit smaller, but it's effectively the same sort of stuff. So with this gear, you can make pretty much I don't know 80, 90 percent of everything you possibly need for for watchmaking. You know. Yep. No, you got the the safe facts for doing pinions. You got the Haas for doing whatever you need yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly. a full on, full on shop. So. I like I like we like yeah. to show show stuff like that, especially because we haven't seen anything uh, uh, from you. So we can show yeah. other up and coming independent watchmakers that uh, it can all be done. You know, the, the, the term the term in house. You know, which I'm trying to get rid of because it's such bullshit at this point. You know, unless you're really in your house, which basically I am. I'm in I'm in my house. Yeah, I am. I'm in my and house. You, you're in your house, right? So we're truly the real in house kind of kind of dudes, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. And to show them. You don't, you, you, yeah, you got to find those machines. I mean, it took me over two and a half years to, to find my uh, my Agathon that just got here that I've been uh -huh. restoring here. So it's harder where I am in this country and obviously where you are if you didn't accumulate a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah. well, I just, just trying to show other, other young watchmakers that's all you need. You know, yeah. you, you can do what you need to do from there, whatever that may be. That's so, like, I all, all the stuff there that I have, I, I bought a lot when I live in Switzerland, you know. I, mean, I brought all that lock, stock, and barrel from Switzerland whenever. I live in, just to be, you know, I, I lived in Switzerland until 2014, and then we left, and we came back home. You know, so all the, the workshop came lock, stock, and barrel with us in a big lorry, you know. But I bought all the stuff there. And, I mean, it's a big, I was just working as a little guy, you know. So, it's a big deal to start to buy those machines. I mean, each year I would save up and buy something else. The very, very first thing I ever bought was that Shogun 70 in the corner, which I still have over there. And that was my very first machine, and I remember going to. We we I bought that from maybe you know I bought that from a guy called Nicolas Cour who who works in uh, Saint Croix. He's a he's a mechanic in Saint Croix, really clever guy. And um and we I bought I didn't even a car then I bought Steve McGonagall's Opel Cadet, 
<laughs> and let, let the, collect this the seventy, you know what I mean, in the back of Stephen's car. So, but each year, you know, you have to work, and that's why I was always, even when I was teaching at Loftet, I was always working on the side. I was always doing kits for Clara or doing kits for somebody, or all the time I was working right from the start to, to earn extra money to, to buy the gear because I always had a plan. I want to have my own workshop. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with it, but I want to have my own workshop, and I want to be tooled up that I'm able to do really whatever I want to do by myself. You know, that was all of my plan. It, 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 gives, it, gives, you, it gives, gives you the freedom. It gives, so yeah. really, it's a peaceful, it's, it's really peaceful in our soul as watchmakers to, to be able to just get up and, and, and be able to make what we need when we get stuck, because we get stuck, yeah. we, we, you know. Yeah. And, that's it, yeah, that's it. As you as you, as you, as especially you know, now you're, you, oh, now you're oh, back in yeah. your, your home co country, you know, representing your country, which for me, as, I, 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 as you can see, what I'm doing here is, it's what I'm trying to do, you know, bring back American watchmaking and mm -hmm. make stuff here that, that hasn't been made in over a hundred years. What I'm doing, yeah. no, nobody's done it, you know, uh, and help others along the way, uh, young watchmakers later on. Yeah, yeah. And I really feel um, heartfelt that you're you're in your home country uh, with the mechanicals as well, and Johnny, you know, really pushing uh, stuff from you're working from your your country. Yeah, I, I, I really had to, I've, you know, I, I, Switzerland was a great experience, you know, and 13 and a half years is a long time, um, but I, I really, <laughs> I, the, last, the last sort of five years particularly, I was more and more homesick, you know, and, and um, you know, I just wanted to come home. We, we had our first child in 2008, and then, you know, it just it became more and more important to sort of make the move. So for the last sort of couple of years, I was trying to jiggle my career into position, my career in inverted commas, my whatever it is I do. <laughs> I, I tried to jiggle my career into position that I could, I could still continue to do that, but no longer physically have to be in Switzerland. You know, right. so whenever I when I started designing the um, when I started designing the proposal calendar for uh, for MBNF, that that job began in I think it was Easter 2012. I started doing that. And perfectly understandably, I, I told them up front, I do want to move home soon, and they said, and I totally understand why they said this. They said we'd really rather you stay. You don't leave Switzerland until the design is completed and you've handed in all the dossier. That was fair enough, to be honest. Mm -hmm. and so I did do that, you know. Um, you always have a pause then. I deliver the whole, I deliver. The, the plan with MBNF is, or any other person I'm doing a watch for is that, you know, we have the idea, I develop all the ideas, do all of the CAD design, do all of the parts, and do all of the technical drawings that you need to go and make the parts. So I will at the end supply you a complete dossier of all the stuff you need to go and make one of these or make 10,000, whatever you like. So. I delivered all that stuff to, to MBNF and then there's a sort of a six month pause while they go and gather all the parts from all their suppliers and then after the six months we reconvene and we do the prototyping. So in, it was in the six months gap that I moved home mm. in 2014. So I moved home in, uh, we came here the first, we came in, I actually remember I left Switzerland on the 26th of May 2014, I still remember the date we flew and um, we, I started prototyping the thing in, um, at Halloween. So, so six months went by, and MBNF knocked on your door, and they're like, "What the fuck did this guy go?" <laughs> yeah, we're not with you. <laughs> oh, well, hey, 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 I got a new number, bro. I'm, uh... It was okay. They, I mean, they knew it was going to go, so I mean, that was fine. But the, so, the, all the point is anyway that the watch was all that watch was all designed in Switzerland in the workshop you've just seen, but it was all prototyped in this room where I'm sitting now. That's amazing. Uh, you know, taking our project away from Switzerland back home with you. Uh, that's what I was thinking, because I, I was speaking to you earlier, you told me that you'd started this work on in 2012, and the yeah. watch released until November 2015. And I'm yeah. thinking right in the middle of this, you have de up sticks, de-jumped, and uh, just picked up the reins in, in, in another country. And uh, it just makes that, uh, it's a great story. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was necessary, you know, it was necessary. But uh, all the, this is, all these other bits and pieces I've been doing have sort of led to that point. You know, as I say, Peter Speak is a very important guy, and he really pushed me. He really pushed me to get involved and think more about construction and learn CAD. And, and it was he who kind of got me to do the first few little projects I ever worked on. You know, so let's I, have a look at the we, we, we found that right, Johnny. We found people as we bop along here, Stephen, and, and we do talk to people. Uh, we found more and more that Stephen's name has been interjected, like he's helped so many people or pushed them or nudged them or done oh, yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and again, somebody, you know, we know, you know, the, the, cop, right. the, the, the collector will know his name from what he's done in the past, but they don't know the behind the scenes. So we definitely want to give big props to him because oh, he's, yeah. cha he's changed many, many of uh, watchmakers lives. Yeah, absolutely. Peter was a, Peter was a very important guy for me, you know, so I can show you. So these are, 
Anyway, point is, right, we're back in, where are we now? We're back in about 2010. And Peter came and he said, look, got an, I've got a wee idea for this. Can you do something? Go and do something. You know, so this is the this is the this watch is the jumping hours, and this is the very first thing that I actually made, which was like, um, you know, it was the first watch that I made that you could actually say I designed this thing and made it and built it, you know, and that then became a watch. So it looked. This is what actually happened, and so for me, this is important because this is kind of my this is my first little sort of a I don't know my little. Can you see this? Yes, we can. There we come. So, okay, so these like, are images that people are most people will never ever have seen these images before. Nobody's ever, I think nobody's really seen this. So, so Peter, so Peter, we had a chat. Peter came to the workshop and he said, Look, what about you do something? It's going to be a jumping R thing, and it might have some sort of hammer which ain't which load which is which is kind of loaded and then it, it really it's released so it's instantaneous. And I went away, thought about it with my new CAD, and I and I designed this, and so this is this is how it came out, you know. So it's cool because it's kind of it's got these um it's got these two big levers here. You can see my little mouse mouse pointer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two big levers, and the levers are the levers are are lo they're loaded at once an hour by the by the effectively by the minute hand thing. There's a wee sort of a cam surface here. You see, so these are these are these are loaded up, and then after an hour, the one on the right hand side will fire, and it will it will hit against the tooth here, and it will rotate the the, the 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 R star by by one twelfth of a turn, you know. So instantaneously it goes boop and on it goes. You see. And it's also got a little warning fix. Whenever the lever is whenever the lever is armed, the little window's red. But after the lever has fired, the window turns white. So nice. if you if you look at the watch at exactly four o'clock, you can tell is it is it just about to fire or has it already fired by looking at the color in the window. You see. So it's a very sort of a simple we think, but um. I was really proud of this because there, there it is again. So, I was really proud of this because this is the first thing I actually designed and made, and I made every single bit of this. I made all the screws. I even made the dial. Um, I didn't make the hands. The hands were street marine hands. Um, but I made all. I even did the pearlage and I did, you know, the whole thing. So, I, I was really and, and this is before I had CNC. So all these springs and levers are literally made completely by hand using the like the jig borer and files. You know, so I, I don't know. This was. I don't know, it's, it's just a wee thing, but I'm really, this was kind of a, this was a, sort of a milestone for me that, you know, I did this and this was, this was kind of a starting point, you know, so. What year, what year was this, Stephen? This is, a, I think this is around sort of 2000, and maybe 2010, something like that. Mm. You know? well, and, and all it does, it's, it's very symmetrical, very, yeah. it's, you know, stand, it stands up to what's going on in independent watchmaking right now. Yeah, that's cool. Absolutely. Beautiful, man. Beautiful. What I like, what is cool about it is, you see, I sort of took Peter's idea and I sort of evolved it. So it's it's actually instantaneous in both directions. You've got two of these. You've got one lever, this lever here on this side. That's its pivoting point. Is the big screw. The lever rotates the star clockwise for normal motion. But if you turn the hands backwards, it's the other lever will instantaneously jump the jump the star backwards again. So it, it's instantaneous in both directions. You see, it's quite mm. it's quite cool. So this finger, the finger comes around. Imagine the fingers turning with the minute hand. So the finger comes around here. When mm -hmm. the finger gets to there, it dislodges this this lever. The lever pivots there, so it's a lever with like three arms. You see, <laughs> and what it will do is it will dislodge this little this little right. clip right here, which allows the big lever to fire and advance. Right. So it doesn't move directions, and I don't know it's come. That's I, a I, that's a really cool safety mechanism that you designed on yeah, a yeah, very cool. cool. So that's I don't know that's sort of my sort of my starting point, I suppose you know, and, and uh, I don't know that was a that was a guess. Uh, an important yes, thing for me to do, you know. And I'm still, I still, I still like it. I don't know what I think. I don't know what happened to it. I think Peter, somebody in America has it or some Peter. So you, uh, how, how, many, how many of those did you make? One. Just one. one. Yeah, just one. So and that, you, that's, you, that's so you're, you're, a little, your first watch. That your little baby is floating around somewhere, and we don't know. It's probably it's probably in somebody's safe somewhere, but it's floating uh, yeah. around. If, maybe, you want, maybe, if, maybe you got, if you have it, Stephen wants it back now. <laughs> <laughs> I, Peter, Peter might well know who has it. I don't know, but um, yeah, um, we only it. just made that one. It was just a sort of a little project, you know. And uh, I don't know. It was a, for me. It was a, it was a big. It was a big. It was a big thing because that was the first thing I did. So, so, so Peter. Peter was the same. Was a big guy and, uh, for me, and so, so they, that was the. Yeah, that's that little watch. And then I suppose that I could show you another thing. So after that, we did. Uh, we did this, so this is now a... Well, yeah, I thought Tim Jackson found a home for Yes, Tim Jackson. What's up, oh, bro? Yeah, okay, okay, there we go, there we go. Right, so, 
Right. So here's another one. So now we have this. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> can, you, can you see this? Yep. Yeah. Here we go. All right. So that so this is another this is another speed marine thing. And, wow. Uh, yeah. So the the idea with this was that we, we, Peter wanted to have a thing with just like three set three three pairs of hands for no real reason. It's just really it's just a sort of a it's just sort of visually a bit of fun. You know? <laughs> it's not it's not three times it was around like that. The three sets of hands all tell exactly the same time. But the, the point with this watch was that it, it really, because you've got three identical sets of hands telling you exactly the same time, they need to be absolutely the same. And the problem with all these gears that you can see, the watch is driven from a pinion in the center. You know, the watch is driven in a sort of normal way from that little pinion in the middle there. You see, it's driving everything. So yeah. you have all these wheels everywhere. And because of that, you have a lot of play in all these gears. And the, the result would be that normally, by the time you get to the hands, the minute hands will be flopping all over the place. You know, because you have so much play in all these gears and they, the play accumulates as you move through the gear trip. Mm -hmm. So that would mean that I, I didn't want to have that. You see, so what I actually have done is I've done a system where it eliminates the play from all the gear trends. If you look closely, actually, at some of these wheels, you can see the wheels are double. Mm -hmm. All the wheels are double, double thickness. Here you can see there's two wheels instead of one. So effectively, it says each gear train is a double gear train, and the bit in the middle is a spring, and the spring creates an artificial tension in each of the gear trains, which means that there's no play. All the play is eliminated. So that if you turn the hands clockwise, all the hands move exactly there, and then if you turn the tiniest fragment anti-clockwise, all the minute hands respond instantly. There's no lag through you know teeth and play and stuff like that. So it's a kind of a it's a neat little thing and uh i don't know i sort of i like that and again i made all of that i did the base plate and the circling and i didn't do the engraving but i did all the rest of it and the speaking right hands that so, is uh, an yeah. extremely unique design that i can't i can't even remember anyone ever doing anything like that doing double wheels straight across yeah yeah it's cool i, I, I like it i mean it's still i don't know again i don't know where this one is <laughs> you, know, you know what it is Stephen? it's it's however we can think each one of us to solve that problem you know, yeah. but whatever that problem solving is, we're all going to have a unique solution to it. Uh, you know, sometimes it's a, if it's a sub second wheel and, you know, you get the, the little spring that you always have to adjust through across the board and on the old eboshes, other people would do it other different ways. That's just yeah. an incredible, incredible mechanism that you came up with. It shows yeah. the complexity of your mind and how it works, man. It's badass. Oh, <laughs> So these these are very important. These little things are very important. They were sort of like many projects, and each one was a you know a huge learning experience for me to sort of reach the point that I actually started to know what I was doing. You know, so um, so okay. So you had those two, and then there was a uh, then there's a let me see, there's a third one. We'll just stop sharing this a wee second, Johnny, all right? And I'll just work. All right. Yeah. This is number this is number three, which is this. Yeah, which is this. So again, this is a speak marine thing, and. Uh, um, uh, we can see there we are. Share screen, share screen. Right, Johnny, do your thing. Okay, let's go. Here, right. So, so again, you can see this, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So again, it's a sort of it's a it's a jumping arse thing with four. It's now got four R hands, <laughs> and it, and the, the the R hands are all instantaneous, and they and they both they both jump in both directions. So. Uh, what happens is you you've got the minute hand. The minute hand's moving normally. So as the minute hand passes twelve, the R hand at the top will advance. Then as the minute hand passes fifteen, the next R hand will jump forward. And then as the as the minute hand passes thirty, this R hand jumps forward, etc., etc. So the the the, the um, each R hand only advances one jump per R, obviously, but they don't advance all together. They advance at fifteen second intervals. So effectively, this is the one which governs. The change in the R from the old R to the new R. This one's after 15 minutes. This one's after 30 minutes, and this one's after 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And so, so that you know where to look and how to read the thing, it's got a little window. It's, you see the four windows. You can't see it very well in the photograph. You need to be looking straight at it. But it's got a window, and how it works is the window, which is red, is the hand that you look at. So if this window is lit up red, you look at this hand. If this window is lit up red, you look at this hand. That's why the the minute hand has got a window. So the window here allows you to see through the minute uh, hand. Oh, I see. <laughs> That's cool, man. That's, <laughs> That's fucking you know, cool, bro. If you imagine the minute hand is exactly at, 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 at 60, then the little window there allows you to see through and read the read the little warning. So that's how it works, you know. So wow. it's a, and that, yeah. So and I was telling Johnny this earlier, but this is, this really? is kind of, so. I again, I made all these stars. I made the screws and I made the base plate and all the springs and you see the background is like um the background is like a sandblasted finish right 
you know. So at, at that time, I didn't have a, I had no sandblasting machine. So I, whenever I did this, I went and I, I rang up Henrik Korpela and I did the sandblasting in, in Henrik's watchmaking school on his machine because I didn't have. <laughs> <laughs> that's great man that's, uh, uh, that's just uh, absolutely absolutely killer man but, uh, yeah people who are watching uh this is uh you know, these, these are pieces that have never been seen before or seen by very few people it's wonderful to have martin pulley on uh it's not wonderful to have tim jackson on as well people who are familiar with these watches going back all this time and uh but just the, the fact that uh so people know you, Stephen, for your work with MBNF, but yeah. it started somewhere. Um, to be able to get a, an insight into this is just uh, you got to well, what, what I like with these things is actually I'm I'm everything you see. I, I sort of I designed it and I made it all. You know, it's all it's all I did. I did all of that. You know, so I, I find it really satisfying to sort of see this and sort of whenever you do something like that, it is it is pleasing. You know, I, I, and my, the way that I work has changed a bit now. I don't, I, I sometimes I don't get the same amount of, I don't get the same satisfaction from it just because of the nature of it. If you do a watch of five hundred and eighty-one components, you can't. If you make them all, you'll be out for years. So you know, it's just not an option anymore. So the nice thing about a project like this is that it's small enough that you can achieve it from beginning to end in about I don't know three months or something. You know, so it's a sort of relatively achievable in a reasonable time frame. You know, you get something to show for it and it works. And it looks pretty and you know so it's it's good for that from a psychological point of view it's mm -hmm. it's good <laughs> so for, but for this time piece uh, you were using oh, no. you were using it as a module was it sitting on top of something oh yeah yeah these are yeah these are all speak marine things so they're all speak marine cases and they're all speak marine based movements yeah and those are all those are all little I, yeah exactly i should explain that sorry those are all what, 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 what was the base ebosh i know do you remember so it was, those are peter peter has own movements i think most of those are peter's own movement that he was, he was doing at that time you know, so that's just, just those go. Those go. I've done so many. You know, one of my passions is is chronos, but uh, and 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 uh, jumping hours and flybacks and all that. But yeah, I, I, I'm I'm real old school. I like the ones with, who are done with hair with hair springs because everybody hacks them up so bad that you know got to make your own hair springs and put them back to normal. And I see you've yeah. gone the other way and uh, and done your way, which is uh, which is just. It's killer, man. The hairsprings are a pain in the ass. They stick all the time. They don't. They yeah. don't last. Mm -hmm. That's it. So yeah. that, that takes us really. The, that's that's what happened. And then I was working on this big project with Peter, and it, it didn't work out because the and Peter, the investment guy, who was kind of financing it, he just he changed his mind. He decided he didn't want to do it anymore. And suddenly, I find myself in two thousand late two thousand eleven with no, or almost no. I had no employment. I was completely in the. I was really in trouble and so then at that point you see remember i had met max in 2005 six and we were i'd helped him on the first what his hm1 and then 2011 i was suddenly in, in, in some difficulties and i rang max and i said i don't know could i possibly make the coffee or clean the floor or something <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> i've asked him a few times but he hasn't gone back to that one yet <laughs> make myself useful in some way so anyway we met we all met up in geneva and, and bear in mind at this point i the, the things i've shown you are that was really i had never done anything more ambitious i only worked on little modules and stuff i never designed a complete movement so max said well what do you think and i, and I said well what about the, i this i had i had had in my I, my mind this for some time this perpetual calendar idea about a calendar that works in a totally different way the conventional, I'm sure you all know, the conventional calendar has a weight of 31 teeth and you, you skip over the teeth that you don't want whenever the month is shorter than 31 days. And it seemed to me logical to, rather than skipping over these teeth that you don't want, use the smallest possible month, which is 28 days, and base the, all the mechanics on, on the wheel with 28 teeth and then add in the extra days. You're not trying to get rid of the days that you don't want. You just add them in as and when you need them. So I always had this idea. I had this idea of a wheel sort of moving segments inside it to solve this problem. But the, the, the idea wasn't in any way developed or fleshed out. It was just really an idea. And I went to Geneva and they said, well, what do you think? And I said, never having designed a complete movement, remember, never. And I said, they said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, maybe some sort of professional calendar. And they were like, right, professional calendar. <laughs> and then I went to Geneva and presented these. So all I had was sketches, really, about this wheel and these movement segments. It was all totally vague. And they somehow were, they somehow were, um, they somehow decided to have a punt on me. And, <laughs> you know, 
Like, I, I don't know, I, it's, it's crazy really, you know, if you think about it. I, I, they, they hired me, you know, almost with, you know, I had no, I had no proven track record in movement design. Let's say like that. that, that the, so the professional calendar was not only the first watch that I did that had any major exposure, but the first watch I did at all. That is, that is my first movement, complete movement. <laughs> That's right. That's just unreal. Well, it is like. For all of us who have worked many on many, many professional calendars previous to your design, we all, all watchmakers who are complicated watchmakers, we all thank you, we all bow to you because they just all suck. You know, it's just, it's a broken mess at all times. As you know, you, I'm sure you've worked on many, or whatever, yeah. maybe, maybe you have. Maybe you have, that's why you're happy to, to, to envision all this, but they are a pain in the ass, man. And with the setting mechanisms, you can't set it from this time to that time. Yeah. You jam up, and then they come back and they sit it. Even if it's a big brand, I don't know if anyone, any uh, collector out there has perpetuals, but if you jam yours up, they always have to go back to Switzerland yeah. and they sit there for years because no one really wants to bother them. Because as soon as we open them up, we have to fully disassemble them. They have to be cleaned anyway, and it, it, it's a very, very big job. So we, yeah, we right. commend you. We thank you for. The whole idea of the mechanism and the whole idea of how the watch is put together comes, it's exactly that. It's from a pragmatic point of view. Max, Max said to me, I said professional calendar, he was, I could see him, you know, start to twitch, you know, because <laughs> he, he, he already, Max, bear in mind, Max had already been like chief executive in Jake Lekrulka and, and he worked for Harry Winston. And so he knew all about the problems of professional calendars and them always coming back and always causing trouble. And I think the last thing on earth he wanted to try was a professional calendar. You know, but what was interesting about the idea was the was the notion right from the start to try to do something which is in some way immune from all these problems. It can be programmed in any position. It can be you you, you can there, you cannot put the calendar into position for which it cannot be retrieved. There is no blocked position or anything like that. So and and, and it makes itself safe. It switches the two push. It switches off the month and year correctors whenever the thing is actually changing. So if you can't correct it, you know, between whatever it is. 10 at night and 2 in the morning whenever those things are going on. So it, it, we, I put a lot of thought into trying to make it as, as foolproof as possible, you know, and, and it's not just, a cal not just a calendar for the sake of doing it differently. It's done in the way it is for, for very clear, logical, practical reasons to make it a better movement. That's yeah. it. You know, it's not just for the for the fun of making something fancy, just for the sake of making something. Well, fun. I can. I that's what I was trying to explain to, to the people that are watching here that uh, who do own perpetuals or are thinking about perpetuals. That even us as watchmakers for so long, say if I was taking a, a part of the part to part module, even mm -hmm. that's all they concentrated on, right? We, as watchmakers, we're sitting there and we're we're going, can't some motherfucker, can't some dude. Design this thing so it doesn't break, you know. And you're the dude. You're that dude we were yelling for. But isn't that really? I also look at look at it like this. You know, I think really from the point of view of the person who's the who owns the watch, it's not it's not really. Surely we can do better than you spend all this money and you end up with something which is as imperfect as it is. You know, I, I thought surely it, this is what sort of frustrates me a bit about Switzerland. That sometimes I find Switzerland can be a bit complacent. You know, the watchmaking industry is very complacent. It, exactly the the professional calendar is a perfect case in point. It's been done in the same way for like, I don't know, 150 years. So just keep doing it the same way, you know. There's no, re why not just completely rethink it? And you can you can, you can can use the same argument for, for many, many different complications on different uh, different aspects of technical watchmaking. You know, why not? Why not have another go? You know, so I don't know. I, I think that for me was part of the challenge was to make something which is actually an, a, a better an improvement, technically an improvement, you know. It's wonderful, man. And that's sort of what we try to do. So I, can, so I can, I have a few, I can show you a few images and stuff from the calendar as well, because the calendar, uh, it is great now, and everybody's delighted with it, and happy days, you know, but it, it is also, it, it almost killed me, you know. As yeah, well, that's just, uh, Martin also asked that question there as well. It must have driven you to near lunacy. <laughs> and there's another uh, regular viewer as well, Captain Forrest, uh, who, is, who says, what is the process of designing a complication? So we're actually just going to deal with that now, I think, and uh, yeah. take a look at uh, the, the process behind it, the problem-solving, the yeah, most I think what most collectors don't really see a lot of is the mathematics that, that, that are involved in what we do. They, yeah. they, know, they know it, they have an idea, but then all they do is see, you know, levers and stuff, but it's, it's, it's insane. 
to math, math. And yeah. I, you know, I used to cut math school in high school, you know, to, to go play my guitar and stuff. It's, yeah. it's bad. It's bad. It's serious math. Yeah, there's, a, there's a two. There's a lot of maths. Uh, a lot of, particularly when you're working at the forces for like the, you know, the energy calculations for like the inertia of the balance and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. There's there's quite a lot of maths to do. It's true, but um, that's, that's you can't have watches without maths if you really want to design them and from first principles. You know, it's it's essential. There's no way of getting around that. But the the thing about the calendar, the thing about the calendar was that it um, it's I had this idea as I say for this this wheel with these moving segments, and that was all fine. So we can, we can look at a wee bit of that. If some of the if some of the images from this, there's a few things I can point out from maybe even, which I kind of prepared a few bits and pieces that we can we can look at, and you can see okay. if these are or not, you know. So we will do this, and then let's get this working right. Okay, Johnny. So yeah. are we there? Yeah. Okay. So, so okay, there's the watch, brilliant. So the so the first thing I suppose the first thing to really the first thing I really didn't like about conventional calendars is this. This is a conventional perpetual calendar. So, you know, you've always got the situation where because you've got 31, the display is 1 to 31, uh, and it's the wheel of 31 teeth, it means that 31 and 1 are always beside each other. To me, this is 30, 311. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, yeah. I think this looks, it looks ridiculous, because for this calendar to be neat and complete, there ought to be a dot in the middle between the 31 and the 1, which differentiates kind of the end of the month. It just to me, it just looks like three hundred and eleven. I, I always thought that. Surely, again, after all this years, surely we can do better than that. You know. So um, there's a few bits and pieces here. I'll, I'll just I'll start with the dials, if you like. The dials. What MBNF wanted was to have these dials, which are like invisible. You know. So the dials appear to float in midair. You yeah. know. You can't see how they're fixed. So the, the idea was to have these dials, which don't have any. You know. That it was to show off the mechanism. And let everything be as visible as possible. This for this for MBNF was, was uh, if you look at the LM1 and LM2, which are the predecessors of this watch. Mine was the third LM, and all of those those first two have got very. They've got the, the mechanism is completely covered. They've got a great big bridge in the front, and all you really see is the dials and the and the um, the big balance. You know, those are the visible bits. And I said to Max, look, because of this mechanism, it's all on the front, and it's completely integrated. It's not a module of any kind. It's fully the, me the calendar mechanism is all integrated into the movement. I said, it's such a. I think we do really need to show this off and make it visible. And Max was very reticent about that. He wasn't keen on the idea. And then I sort of talked him around, and I said, okay, well, look, we'll go with it. He said, and we'll see if it's, we'll see how it goes, sort of thing. So the idea was that if we're going to do that, we need to make that the dials look like they're sort of floating in space. You see, so you can't see how they're fixed. So the dials are like that, and then if you look from the side, how it's actually done is it's got these, the dial has got these bridles underneath. So the, the post here is, is pressed into the main plate, and the bridle is solid with the, it's screwed to the bottom of the dial, and then there's like a, a locking screw on both sides. So it means that whenever you look at the watch from the top, you can't see how the dials are fixed. Mm. So that, was sort of one of the, that was sort of the first, one of the first things aesthetically, which is very important for MBNF, they wanted it like that. We'll come back to that. There's a few bits and pieces there. Um, okay, so the next thing was the balance staff because I, I because of the perpetual calendar, it took up so much space that there was no way. If you look at LM one, it's got the escapement on the on the front of the watch right. where the balance is. But I, I had no, I had taken up every possible square millimeter of space with the calendar, so there was nowhere to put the escapement. It wouldn't fit. So my solution was to put the balance, put the escapement on the opposite side of the watch and have this super long balance staff. So the one on the left is the LM one. Balance stuff, mm -hmm. and for comparison, the one on the right is the perpetual calendar balance stuff, which is like ridiculously long. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so this was, I, I went and presented this in Geneva to MBNF, and they were very iffy about this. They they really were concerned that it is not going to work properly, particularly because the balance wheel is nowhere near the center of the shaft. The balance wheel is way up at one end, mm -hmm. and they thought this is going to cause problems. It's not going to it won't work properly. So in order to solve the problem, what I did was I. I made the I made the balance that they MBNF lent me the prototype movement of LM1. This is the actual pr uh, prototype in my in the split in the workshop in this hotel, and I I, I turned myself. I hand turned the balance staff, the super long balance staff, mm -hmm. and um, I fitted it to the LM1 balance. And I made extension pillars for the LM1 balance bridge, so I was able to fit my super long balance onto the LM1 prototype. So in this way, it got it all work. And this way, we were able to prove actually the balance that works fine and doesn't cause any problems. So this picture is the actual prototype that I made for the for the long balance stuff. And again, nobody has really nobody's really seen that, but you can see it's LM wow. super long balance stuff. You know, so what, there was what, what, what material were you turning the balance stuff out of? 
it's just it's just IP20 and then hardened, you know, with a really old fashioned way with a flame and the oil, mm-hmm. you know, quenched in oil, and then finished off afterwards, you know. So it's, it's really it's hard to turn because it's uh, it's almost twelve millimeters long. So it was a bit of a nightmare, but it was good for my turning. <laughs> you know, keep your turning and uh, keep your turning skills up to scratch. You know, so you just <laughs> you can see how it works. So this is the this is the this is the perpetual calendar, and then the uh, the escape. And we're looking at the bridge side now. We're not on the we're not on the perpetual calendar side. We're on the bridge side. Here's the escape, one. and then if I take the bridge off, you can see. That's the end of the balance staff. You see, it's come, where it comes right through the movement. You see, so the balance staff is long enough to pass the whole way through the movement. So that that solved the problem, but it made the balance staff difficult. So, it, but it, it it works fine. There we go. That's that. What, what, what did they say uh, whenever you came back with your? your uh... Oh no, they, 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 listen. They were. I mean, if we're, they were absolutely right to question it. I mean, they were. You know, it's a it's a perfectly valid point, and I think it was very it was a very worth, worthwhile exercise to prove. Just to prove to everybody that uh, you know, to put everybody's mind at rest. I, I think that was, it was entirely worthwhile. So you know, that was good. Move on to the next problem. You know, so the next the next problem is this was the processor. But this is the this is the magical wheel with all the layers and moving segments. So this is the heart of the of the whole watch. If if we look at this is the actual this is the, my actual three D design of the of the um, this is my actual three D CAD of the perpetual calendar. Although I've taken off the balance, the balance bridge, and all the dials, so you can see more clearly. So. The magic wheel is in here. That's the kind of the heart of the watch, and it's the bit that you program on the twenty fifth of the month, according to the length of the current month. You see, so it'll you program it. The, the magic programming happens only on the twenty fifth, and you'll program it to give you twenty eight, twenty nine, thirty, or thirty one days. So it's programmed here, and it's it's the, it's this orange lever which advances the the magic wheel once every day. So this guy this guy comes in. The little tooth here moves the. The the, um, the 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 processor one click anti clockwise every day. So that's basically what's going on. So this is the processor, and then if we split the processor up into its component parts, we'll explode it. Then you can see you've got the the um, the green bits of the moving segments. Those are the bits. Those are the bits which are actually programmed. So the green, the two green segments, they are they're fixed to one another, but they're able to rotate within the overall uh, sub-assembly of the, of the processor wheel. And whenever you program it, you will rotate these. You see there's a big gap here. You'll rotate the segments clockwise by one, two, three, or four teeth, depending on whether you want to have a month of 28, 29, 30, or 31 days. Mm. So you program on the 28th, and then at the end of the month, the processor wheel will spit back out again that which you programmed on the 25th. So that's, that's, the, that's, the, kind of, that, that's the crux of it, really. This is how it looks whenever it's, this is on the 25th, just before programming. So what will happen, you can see this finger has come in, it's just advanced the wheel uh, anti-clockwise by one click. So we're now on the 25th. And the next thing that will happen is the, 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 um, orange, the orange tooth will move out of the way. Because if we go back to this, you can see the big screw there, that's the pivoting point of the orange lever. So that's the little finger you've just seen, which advances the wheel. And if we go back to this, then... What's now going to happen is the finger is going to move out of the way, and this this arm is going to come in, and it's going to make contact with a pin, and it's going to the wheel will stay still, but the the arm will will rotate the segments, push the pin, and rotate the segments one, two, three, or four clicks, depending on what we want to program. Mm. That's how it works. You see, so uh, so the big the big problem I had was that this little leap, this, the arm comes in, the arm will stop at the right position, but what you've got to remember is that whenever this programming happens. The orange lever is moving. It's it's very fast. It's high speed. The orange the orange lever it's instantaneous. The orange lever comes in very fast, bangs into the pin. The orange lever will stop in the right place. But the problem is the program is only correct if at the end of when everything stops moving, if the pin is in contact with the lever. And the problem is because you have a hard impact here, the lever will stop in the right place. But the pin is free, is free to fly off and stop anywhere he likes in the in the slot. And if he doesn't stop leaning against the orange lever, the programming's wrong. And this was this, it turned out that this was ultimately this was the thing that almost killed the entire project because I had solved everything else except this one little detail. I could not work out how I was going to crack this. And the problem is that whenever we I I, I put in another jumper spring here to act as a break. To right. th- the idea that whenever the thing come, whenever this impact happens. This other spring, it'll, because this spring works for the green segments, this spring will slow down the green segments and everything, it'll stop nicely and it'll just it'll be leaning against this thing. Right. So I, I knew for over a year that there was a problem and I, was, I worried myself sick. I didn't sleep, I didn't eat properly, I didn't do anything properly. And I knew this was going to be a problem. And ultimately, it's the kind of thing that you can't tell until you get to the prototyping. So we built the prototype here in Belfast. 
and it was a disaster. It didn't work at all. It just did not work at all. And I couldn't find a solution, you know. And during this time, I was so worried about this in this previous year before I left Switzerland. I contacted a guy called Michel Vermo. Michel Vermo is a cool guy. He's the guy who wrote the textbook for the engineering school for if you want to become a watchmaking constructor. Very clever guy. And I got him and I got him to look at this and analyze. And he went away and thought about it. He came back to me and he said, because of the sort of the kind of contra-rotating motion of what the, the different bits, what the different bits are doing here, there is no real perfect solution to this. There's no way that you can create an absolutely foolproof blocking system which will make the pin sit there. You've just got to persuade the pin to sit there using brakes and other ways of slowing the thing down. So I, we went with that, we built the prototype and it, it didn't work at all. And I had been searching for this proper solution for over a year. And uh, there, there, you know, there was no proper solution and I couldn't, I, I just couldn't get it to, to work. You know, so there you go. So that's programming a month of 28. You see, it comes in and it'll move just one click into the first position. That's 28, then 29, 30, 31. So that's right. what it's doing. This is only working properly. The orange lever stops in the right place, but the program's only right if the pin is leaning against the orange lever whenever everything stops moving. Mm -hmm. There's the there's the, the, the crux of the difficulty. And there's, the, there's program 29, you see, and so it moves forward. So I couldn't see how to do this. And this was like a, this was like a Thursday or something this happened. And then I couldn't find the problem, the solution, and there still was no solution. And I went, I'd had various, went, went to the pub all weekend, and then I was <laughs> here very sick on Monday morning and quite, feeling quite hungover, to be honest. And this solution just dropped out of the sky into my head, like by magic. It just, it just fell into my head. And I can't explain why, I don't know where, what happened, but... The solution was an extra bit on this lever, and I'm going to show you that just now, quickly, if I can. So this is the original. This is how the watch looked originally. This is the this yellow lever is the bit that comes down. He's the bit that touches against the month cam. So the month cam has got the different steps, you know, for the different lengths of the month. He comes down and touches the month cam, and, and then programs correctly the wheel. And the problem was there was no way, no way to, say, to stop this thing happening. The solution. Okay, first of all, this is my diary. This is my diary for February 2013. I had been agonizing over this problem in Switzerland. This is, this is my life. So like Friday, worked until 2 a.m. Saturday, worked four hours. And I drew this shepherd crook thing with slots because I thought I, if I could add this part, you see the lever is there. Right. If, I could, if I could add this shepherd crook bit here, this would move in as we program and there'd be a second pin here sticking up. And that means that while this pin moves clockwise, this pin would move clockwise, and this hook could come in and catch the pin and make them stop. Uh, and that was my plan, you see. And I thought maybe I could do that, but there's a big problem. That's so I, you see, I already drawn this in 2013 February, but it wasn't possible to, to make it happen. This is how the watch ended up, and you see, it's now got an extra slot, and there's the pin we talked about, and this extra part on the yellow lever with the shepherd's crook tail. But the difficulty, and this is what I couldn't work out, is this, whenever you do the programming, the, the, the yellow lever moves in, and the, it does indeed catch the pin and make the pin stop in the right place, because the pin can't go any further, you see? But what you must understand is that on the yellow lever, the big screw there is the pivoting point of the yellow lever. So the next thing, the next thing that's gonna happen is that one day later, everything starts to advance again. The next thing that's going to happen is the orange lever is going to come in to advance another day and the yellow lever is going to move out. But the yellow lever can't move out because he's trapped by the pin. Mm -hmm. So it programs one and then the whole mechanism is blocked. And whenever I was drawing on my diary that thing, I had this idea, but the problem was it only works once and then you, you can't use it, you know, it doesn't work. It doesn't allow you to continue programming. And the brainwave that I had was, was this actually. The lever, it turns out the lever's not solid. It turns out the lever has got slots underneath. And so whenever it programs, the pin bangs up against the corner and stops where it ought to stop. But then whenever the yellow lever has to move away, the pin stays where it is and the slot moves over the pin and allows the yellow lever to escape. Mm. That's brilliant. <laughs> and that's right. It, it was that that almost killed me. Because this is I, I've, what I've explained in five or ten minutes. I agonized over for over a year, and I mean agonized. I have never had anxiety like it, and, and I'm not somebody who handles anxiety very well. So that's how it works. There you see the lever with the slots. That's the, that, that's how it works. So I, every one of those calendars has that's the that is what makes the that's what makes the watch possible. Without this, it's not that I would do it a different way or find a different way around this problem. There was no other way to solve this. Without that idea, the whole project's dead. Right.
Only. Only. Just, you know, you know the, the, the agony is you had like 99.8% there and you know it works in your yeah. mind. It's like, how, how, how? I, I figured everything else out, right? It, okay. it's just, it, I got to I gotta beat this. I got to beat this. And that's the perseverance of a true, of a true watchmaker and, and of what we do at this level of what we do. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's mind boggling and there's no one else that can help us. And dropping it out of the sky, that, that whole thing, dude, the same thing happens in music when we're writing right. a song. Sure. Write a song that, that's going to be as original. No, nothing else sounds like it. You've never, you've never made riffs like this or, or uh, chord progressions like this because in my past music, it broke all the rules. It didn't go by chord progressions by a certain way. It wasn't jazz. It wasn't this. It wasn't that. But yeah. Things just don't fit. And it could be six, eight, ten months. And you just, you're all getting together. You play the song and you just, nope, nope, nope. And one day, bam, somebody plays a note, a sound or something. And there it is. Mm -hmm. That was the key. And it all just flows from there. So yeah, there's there's a lot of to hear the story behind that. Like it, it, and the same with the music as well. Where does it come from? Where did this inspiration come from? You, you get, the, the moral of the story here is, if you're watching, you just perseverance, man. Don't don't give up. It's there, you know. If not, you know, you do have to may have to change this, change that. But it's the ones who persevere in the long run. Don't be a quitter, man. Just follow yeah. through. It sometimes it takes that long and, and it just pops. And you got to go to the pub. Sometimes you got to go to the pub. That was, yeah, that was really the key, bro. <laughs> that was a great idea. <laughs> but then, um, just there's a few questions here, just on this, just but while we're on this at the minute, uh, Stephen. Firstly, thanks a million for just that. Yeah, that was that's really good. That'll help a lot of people. Never seen a like about my what, life. What not, not kind of uh, technical <laughs> breakdown and explanation. So Martin has asked a couple, two or three questions. Is each of the green bits are on their own pivot? Uh, well, you know, the, the green bits, all they all pivot on the central shaft of the wheel. Okay, and? The strength of the jumper spring and its adjustment is most important. Yes, most mm. important. <laughs> yeah. I can, I can confirm that is the case, yeah. Very important, yeah. Okay. And again, that's why, that's why like, whenever we did the prototyping, that's why there's no point in, in there, it's necessary for me to make all the springs because in a calendar particularly, you have a, it's the same thing in a minute repeater or something, you have a huge interplay between all the different springs all working together and working against each other. And you have to have a perfect balance between all these springs. So that's why it makes sense that the springs are amongst the components I make here because it's almost for sure they're gonna to have to be changed and, and modified. So if I do them here, I can be very reactive. I can make them straight away and have a bit modified spring in two hours. Whereas if I send it to Switzerland, it'll be, it'll be a couple of months. You know, so all that stuff is done here. Yeah, and that's, but, that's, yeah. that's a lot of, uh, even the old perpetual calendars. That's why it takes so long, up to a year to train someone uh, just yeah. on one perpetual. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, is yeah. not just all the mechanisms, just uh, yeah. for anyone that's interested. It, it is a lot yeah. to do with the, the tension of each and every jumper spring and checking it. Exactly. And that person knows that. So when Steven says he's preparing his springs, I was just going to ask him, that. How, how is anybody else putting together, uh, you know, well, putting together? That, that's a great, that's actually a great question because one of the, right, to go right back to the start of the project, Max came, we were in the first weeks of the project and Max came to my workshop and he said, he said something like, I, I, we were talking about adjustments, and he said, yeah, but you know, there can't, there can't be any adjustments. This, you just, this, you have to <laughs> design it in such a way that the watchmaker gets the kit of parts, he just puts it together, mm -hmm. he boils it, winds it up, and it goes, but that's, that's how it works. And it does do that. that. The whole calendar is, once I adjusted the springs and gave them the master copies of all the plans for the springs, I mean, that, that, that is the plan, and that's how they do it. They just assemble it, and it works. Yeah, I mean, because, I, because I, you I, have the, you have you know by touch, by feel, by know how, by experience, exactly the tension of those springs, and so you're making them and you're sending them along with the kit. This, that's the part that we need to you know, explain to people yeah. who never get to work on perpetuals and the complexities of what they are. It, it's uh, it's it's it is that final, you know. Uh -huh. The tension of every spring. It, if you if you work on chronographs or vintage chronographs, you know, like on a mounted minute recorder, on uh, the old Landerons and so forth, it's that spring that's always broken. You know, it has to have that exact tension multiplied out by a hundred in perpetuals. They have to be yeah. exact. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, but but they, as I say, that the project is good. Are the thing the story's condensed under ten minutes there? But I mean, I uh, I'm a person who. Um, I, as I say, my many character flaws, one of the things I struggle most with. <laughs> uh, 
his anxiety and, and stress management and I I, um, I, I, uh, I really whenever I do this kind of stuff it's it's not just a job it's not just a, it, it, it's tor it's utter torment really I mean I can't I can't I often say I can't live with what's me but I can't live without it you know and mm. I compare it more to an addiction a drug addiction with all the negative connotations that that is and people sometimes say oh you're so lucky you know you're doing what you love and in a sense that's true but um watchmaking absolutely torments me and i wish to god i could be free of it sometimes but i just i can't it, it, it drives me to distraction because all these things that we're talking about now so quickly i can't i dream about them i have nightmares about them i can't sleep because of them. i lie in bed awake for hours and days thinking about them i never get peace from it when i go out with my kids and stuff I, it's always good around I, this screen i can bring up and the, i can just work on it when i'm standing at the taking my kids to school or whatever you know it and doesn't, I wish it, it doesn't turn off for most of us. Right? Just, you're not, I'm just saying you're not you're not alone. You know, yeah. you know this stuff is this stuff is really this. I want to try to explain that this is, you know, it's not. It's this is really this is particularly for me because I manage this stuff very badly. I, I know that I do, but this stuff is really hard. It is really hard to live with. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We yeah. live on we live on the edge, you know, all the time. But being a creator, being a creator, and being a restorer, which is you know, I, I've gone through those those ranks as well. It, it, I'm just letting you know, we all we we, we had that same disease. It's a love hate thing, uh, and it, and when you're a creator, it goes beyond that. It, it it's it never stops. Music never stops when you're creating at a creator, not just someone who's in a bar band playing other people's tunes when you're yeah, creating your own and all that it's the same thing it's you don't sleep it's everything's bothering the littlest thing bothering and it's beyond ocd because i'm sure you have ocd i don't know if you line stuff up in, in that kind of ocd but we have to have ocd to perpetually peck away at that stuff we can't sleep about and yeah I, I, I just don't know how, how many more of these things i can i can survive that's all <laughs> you'll get there <laughs> I'm sitting there. I'm designing my own barrel system right now, which is it's not a going barrel. It's something completely different. So it's the Go same ahead. kind of thing. I've been here for three weeks in in, mm -hmm. in CAD, and now we're about to start uh, 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 prototype production. So it, that's where I'm at. That's where my head is. I'm not sleeping. I'm I'm waking up like or not waking up and freaking out. Is this going to fit this and that and the other thing? So I know yeah. where you're at, and we're, we're all okay. we're all yeah. with you, man. Yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> exciting. It's great to do this stuff. You know, but there's always a there's a and the, the thing as well is you've got to understand is the projects are so long, you know, so like that MBNF thing, I started working on it in, I think, maybe February, March 2012. And I, I delivered the whole, like it was done super fast because I worked night and day on it, you know what I mean? Because I was, I was still young and, uh, I was still young and, <laughs> I, I wasn't, uh, you know, I, 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 was, I had more energy, I suppose, and I wasn't quite so cynical, but I was, I did it really fast. But anyway, begin 2012. And the whole dossier was delivered, I think, uh, late, like, oh, maybe uh, like September, October 2013. So the whole thing from A to Z, the whole design and all the plans all done in basically 18 months. And then we had this, we had this uh, six month gap and, then, and so on. And then I did the, the prototyping, you know, but the, the prototyping was done late 2014. So that's, if you look at the overall project, it's two and a half, it's two and a half years. It's a really long time to be just doing this. And whenever you're halfway through that, it's so hard to still keep motivated and still keep doing it because the end is so far away and yet the beginning is also so far away, you know. And the way how I operate is that there's only me in this room, there's only me. I, I don't have any team, I don't have any people that work for me. I do the whole it's just me does the design from A to Z and all the plans and the prototyping and all the stuff. And I can't work more or harder than I already do. It's just not possible. You know, so it means that the problem is that I can only work one project after another. And it means that inevitably the projects take a very long time for me to get from the start to the finish of one. So it's a, it's a real strain, you know, because I, I as I said to Johnny yesterday, if I, you know, I've probably only got about six of these in my entire professional life, you know, you just can't do more, you know, and I think that's frustrating. So, but, but Stephen, you're in your own home, right? You have all your gear oh, yeah. in your own home. Yeah, yeah. You've, you've infiltrated your home. So it's a, it's a two-step to, to commute. And you're doing fabulous. You know, you're yeah. spreading, you're giving love back to the world. And I know, you know, I know, I know, I know. But you see, that's, in a way, Dan, that's the other problem because I, I, have, I also have a terrible um, work-life balance, you know, and, and uh, you know, my daughter always says to me, you know, six o'clock, you need to come out. She's going to put a lock on the door. <laughs> It happens all the time, all the time. The kids go to bed and then <laughs> it's ha all the time. Something pops into my head. Oh my God, have I thought of this? It's <laughs> how, 
have I considered this? Is that part in the right way around? Is whatever it is, and I have to come back down to the workshop, put the lights on, and then it's suddenly it's two in the morning, you know, and I've been in here for like another three and a half hours, and uh, and then I'm up again at six, and it, it's just it's absolutely relentless. And I, I, I Nurse Hotel was great, you see, because in Nurse Hotel, uh, where we had the workshop, you saw the pictures earlier. It was like two, it, was, it wasn't far, it was two kilometers away. So it was just far enough. You had to either get in the bus or get in the car and drive up there. So it, it was just far enough that I couldn't just do it like that. Right. Like, right. something. Whereas here, it's just down off the stairs and I can come down here anytime I want. And it's just too easy. And in a sense, it's, uh, I, I don't, I'm not a person who's able to manage this balance well at all. And it's, I have to get something which at the minute I'm really, really, really struggling with. That, you're living like a rock star now, bro. <laughs> That's the <laughs> same. It's, it's no different. If the riff hits you at 1 a.m., I'm, I'm freaking picking up my guitar, bro. And it's putting, I got to put it down on tape now. That's just yeah. the way it goes. I know, but so, you know, sometimes I just, I really, really wish to God I was just like a, I wish I was a postman. <laughs> you know, or, yeah, but the rest of the world is out of no, but and, and being, a, being a postman is a really important and absolutely necessary job. I just think that I, I think I'm just trying to sleep better at night if I was, you know, a postman or, if, if you, you know, a farmer, like, you'd be in the shit at 1 a.m. Well, <laughs> you'd be in the stall with the horse. You know, there's, there's also uh, the thing about it too, like, you know, uh, I, I love our postmen. They're great. They're absolutely great uh -huh. guys. Get uh -huh. the guy to call here. Uh, but do you know, uh, and, and I know it won't be important to you when you're gone. And it sounds like your calendar has actually taken years off your life. There are times I really think that it, it, it has. It, it's, it, 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 that project really changed me forever. I mean, it, it sounds funny, but it really took a toll on. It did. There was a cost. That project had an emotional cost. It really did. It really, I gave everything I could, I had to give to that and, and make it successful and survive. So, so Stephen, so, so you talked about your first watch and the second one, um, that it gave you such great, incredible satisfaction, right? Yeah. To produce, to produce those first two things because they really felt like they were a part of you. You know, yeah, that's right. do you think now? I, I know that you've you're not really social on social media too active and that kind of stuff, but I'm sure you pop around and, and no, 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 I'm sure I'm sure I don't even have a smartphone. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Oh, this is awesome, bro. <laughs> uh, so, so, Fred Flintstone. So, here's how this goes. So, I, I'm sure you're aware of the state of independent watchmaking, how incredible oh, yeah. it's leapfrogged, how, how, how we are now the innovators. We're not looked at any other way. We are, because what we're making now is true mechanical art. We don't have to see the time anymore. It really right. is pushing right. every, every boundary. And 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 we can be paid greatly for the time that people can now see that it takes mm -hmm. to do this what we do because a lot of that has been hidden until me and johnny are exposing some of the pain and the suffering and the years that go by for someone such as you to develop something like this so what yeah. i'm getting at is do you think in the near future or somewhere along the lines that you will produce again something but actually stamp your name on it and even if it's not full time, but one or two pieces a year or something like that, to give you that satisfaction it doesn't have to be the world's most complicated anything. For like what I'm doing is uh is very complicated, but my my philosophy is my philosophy. It's keep mm -hmm. things keep complicated mechanisms to the, the least amount of parts possible because I did so much in restoration. That's my gig. Whatever your gig is that to make you satisfied to producing something. Do you ever think? Think about that as you lay awake. Well, I, 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 yeah, I have, the answer is yeah. I mean, I have thought about it, and obviously, I've been surrounded by it for all those years by all those independent people that we've discussed. You know, Peter and yeah. McGonagall's and so on and so forth. You know, so I've certainly been. I've, I've seen plenty of that at very close quarters. You know, it, it sort of goes back to the bit about um, the Radiohead song. You know, which is where we began. How to disappear completely? So I, I, I'm not somebody who I, I really, I really don't want to. I, I like to be invisible. That's why, as you say, nobody really knows about anything about me, and I, I like it like that, you know. And uh, you know, you all know, I'm sure that a lot of the watchmakers who are the independents, they have to spend an awful lot of time on the road, going around all the different fairs and all the different events, you know, telling their story and selling the watches and creating this whole, um, you know, really, really making the story come alive, you know. And I, I just don't think I don't know if that's really in me at all. And I, what I, what my my big, big, big interest has always been in the deeply technical side of watchmaking. There's a lot of these, there's a lot of independents who, 
who started off, you know, really in watchmaking. A lot of the, there's some, I'm sure you can think of a few guys, but there's a lot of those guys who now travel the world selling their watches, but they actually don't do very much watchmaking anymore. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a lot of that. And my interest is absolutely in the technical side, purely, purely, purely. And living as I do, when I've got people like MBNF and stuff, MBNF get me to do a job and they leave me alone. And I'm left alone to, to you know, to live out all my whims and, you know, take all this detail as far as I like and stuff. And it suits me really well to be left, just to be left alone to do that. I don't know if I could also be the guy who, goes and sells the things. I I, uh, I have thought about you. You're right, Dan. I have I have given this thought, and I have wondered maybe a point will come where I'm going to maybe have to make maybe five or ten some things just you know that for that's for my. Right. I've got that's, what I here. that's what I see to fit. Not even Stephen. You wouldn't have to travel if you just you did what you do. But maybe you you come up with your your basic design of your movement, whatever, and produce one or two pieces a year, even whatever that is, to, to satisfy just, I, yourself. You wouldn't, have to go, you wouldn't have to be a salesman hawking any of that because there, you would meet very nice collectors who would who would, who would probably pre-order. Well, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I've really got the... Um, I don't know that I'm... I think I'm too much on the technical side to really get involved in anything which is commercial. I mean, I would, I would never say never, but it could well be that I make something and, you know, there's five or ten finished watches, but some of them they're going to be found in the drawer here after I'm dead. You know, I don't know. <laughs> 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 that's awesome man you see it's not about the, it sounds really cliche to say this but the watchmaker is like a it's a fundamental requirement that I have in order to breathe I have to do it I can't really live without it it drives me around the bend but you know even if I'm retired so I'll still be doing this I won't ever be able to really not do this but I would like to do it what I would like to do would be do it in a way where I'm not it's not quite so pressurized and stressful and I as I say I'm somebody who has a, a particular difficulties in dealing with that because I I just don't have the, enough of an attitude to take things in my stride. Every little, every little problem I come against absolutely consumes me and drives me to distraction. And I can't sleep or do anything until the thing is solved. And that's why the perpetual calendar was so hard because I was in that state of torment for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And I just had this constant constriction type in my chest the whole time and that flipping that adrenaline valve was just pumping non-stop you know and that's, wow. that's not there's no way to live <laughs> no, no but, but steve what i was trying to say to you earlier is like, i'm the same way there's a lot of us the same way that's that's yeah. that's the way we're built man and and if imagine if you didn't have this outlet to sit at the bench and and or, or want to hurl everything against the wall but you can't yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? If I hurl it, it's gone. I'm never going to find it. It's too small. So all no, we do is it builds up like tension, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We all we all have that, and it's it's the yeah. challenge, man. The challenge is what it's all about. Same yeah. thing. Yeah. I was a lead guitar player. You know, the challenge is how can you how can you do things that it's you know it's impossible to move your fingers that way and bend it that exact way to get that exact thing and the exact sound. How is that done? It's it's imperfection perfectionism. You'll never get there. We're humans. It's never everything. Everything is never going to be 100% perfect every single day. Yeah, 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 I could have yeah, jumped yeah. on stage and had an incredible night and ripped people's faces off. And every note I played was perfect that night. So I'm going to backtrack it in my diary. I'm going to say, what did I eat that day? How many hours did I sleep that day? Was I on the tour bus for this long? Did I meet six fans or five fans? What did I do that day? I'm going to do that tomorrow. And I do that tomorrow and I play like crap. <laughs> it, it's more human, man. You know, it's the way it is. I know, but the, 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 I think it's that it's that sort of perfect. It is. I mean, I've looked it up. It is sort of perfectionism, but and that's sort of that's one of the things I sort of struggle with. But that sounds. Whenever you say perfectionism, it sounds as if you know. Oh, I just love everything to be just perfect, and that's all. It's not. It's perfectionism is a is a. It's a it's a like it's a psychological thing and it's a real it's no it's absolutely no fun at all you know with your <laughs> I'm driven by forces that I can neither control under or understand to try to do things in a certain way and if they're not oh, absolutely like I I'm obsessed with detail and the most minute pushing into the tiniest 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 levels of detail I even torment MBNF because I'm always sending them emails asking for the most ridiculous tiny little details on certain things you know. And, and uh, I, I can never, I just can never stop delving deeper and deeper. But the result is that I am becoming, you know, my grip on my grip on reality and my grip on my sanity is becoming more and more tenuous, you know. But, right. but did you not feel really satisfied whenever you see the reception? 
Uh, well, uh, like for example, the 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 LMP uh, uh, Evil, which was released this week, that was a astonishing piece. Fifteen <coughs> of orange, fifteen in black, fifteen in blue, all sold out within three days. I was I didn't know that. Is that right? I didn't know that. Oh, oh really? Okay. 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 Excellent. Well, Mike, Max will be delighted. He will, of course, but does that not give you? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't. It, it does. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be stupid to say that I'm not proud. Of it. I'm, really, I'm really proud of it. I'm, I get a real, I get a real thrill from seeing that it's so well received. But that, at the same time, I, I, whenever you, whenever you contacted me, Johnny, again, and you said that I do this, I mean, my always my first reaction to that watch is I get this kind of a. It's like somebody's punched me in the stomach. I always feel, oh no, what's wrong? You know, it's always like a. I had such a bad time with that watch that I still. It's almost like um. Post traumatic stress disorder or something. It, 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 like, it, even, even whenever I was, even sometimes when I would get an, an email from MBNF of asking me to maybe some detail of a plan or can you change this? Uh, can you change this from like ruby and plating to gold plating? Some tiny bit detail on the plan. Every time the email would come in, I'd think, oh no, it's, it doesn't work. They found something fundamentally wrong with it. That's what went through my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. It's really. I, 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 I have to say, Tuesday, all the yeah. Tuesday worst case scenario <laughs> opening up everything. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, all the time. You know, I, 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 I drive my wife absolutely mad. You know, because I'm, I'm so flippant and miserable. You know, I mean, you know, the glass half empty, half full. My glass, <laughs> my glass is get barely a drop in it. You know, it's <laughs> terrible. Like, it's awesome, man. It's awesome. Oh, you know, wow. at, at least you know what you are, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Like that. Some people don't know. They try to go to doctor and doctor to try to figure yeah. it all out. They, they, <laughs> you know, there goes all their money, right? To psychologists, psychiatrists, and everything. You know, hey, you, know, you can reinvent the perpetual calendar completely from scratch and just, you can analyze yourself too. Like, you know, I would say. Well, well, you know, wait, wait, wait till you see what's coming next. I can't tell you, but I'm waiting till you see what's coming next. Wow. Well, I was going to ask you that question before you like that, because we're, right. I know we've gone over time, but uh, I was going to say, so you've reinvented the perpetual calendar. Is there another complication that you re could reinvent, or is that something you'd have to kill me if you told me? I, I, well, there's, the, the first answer is there's endless watchmaking has got endless potential. There's there's no there is literally no shortage of what you can do with watchmaking and how you can change mechanics and think up new mechanisms or reinvent old mechanisms or do things in totally new ways or find new problems to solve. It is absolutely limitless. That's the first thing. The second thing is yes, if I told you what I'd done, I would have to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> On that point, I think, folks, while I'm breathing and above ground and uh, <laughs> with, with, the, with the sod still beneath my feet instead That's of over it. my head. Uh, so, folks, uh, firstly, Stephen, I just want to uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming and uh, joining us tonight and making this uh, such a fantastic and memorable uh, occasion for Thanks. me, for Dan, but also for the people who have been following and watching. The comments have been pouring in all evening. And um, it's just been, uh, you know, I, I, if I had one thing to say, I, 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 I wish you could appreciate what you do more and enjoy it more because you do it. Like I could appreciate. I know there's a story that we didn't get telling, and it involved a bus ticket and set, oh, set yeah, yeah. there. Maybe another time we can uh, we can do that. But uh, I, I just, I, 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 so many people get pleasure out of what you do, and what you create, and what what comes out of your imagination and your hands and um, i would just love to i, I know it, me telling you you know, enjoy it a bit more doesn't help you enjoy it a bit more but just uh, yeah, I, exactly. I, I would love to think that you did uh, you realize how much your work is appreciated by all the people and as i say max has sold out those uh, 45 incredible evil pieces well uh, yeah. And that, that pretty much tells the story. Yeah, we, we, we're all we're all here, Stephen, just to tell you we know you you have a phone from 1998 and you can't see anything. But yeah, yeah. We're, we're all here that you're just to tell you that from where you are, the pain, the suffering is really just giving love back to the world. You've invented new, you've invented new things that show us as watchmakers, show collectors, 
uh, and heighten independent watchmaking from the bottom level of independent watchmaking to the birth of the third wave that we're here now to me and Johnny trying to help everyone to understand what really makes all of us uh, uh, the crazy watchmakers that we are at, at this level uh, really do what we do and the pain the suffering that we really uh, inherently have inside each day to bring that love to the world and you bring it in spades and be it, you're working with MBNF and whatever that 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 is just them selling out those watches that fast should tell you all you need to know you know well, let, it, let it come back to you okay. so maybe you'll get one good night's sleep out of what I just said and then you'll be back <laughs> to normal bro <laughs> no that's <laughs> Yeah, thank God for wine. You say it's not right <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Hey, come up around Carly for lock some time. We'll go for a good walk up the beach. So we'll unplug a little bit, like you know. Right. I hold you lot time. Absolutely. You, you, Any time, my man. You're more than welcome. And uh, but, folks, listen. Uh, for those who who've stayed with us for the last uh, hour and forty minutes, thank you so much for once again tuning in to In the Metal to really catch a, a, an amazing story see some incredible images of watches that have practically never been seen before and to hear how that incredible perpetual calendar came to be the hard way nothing comes easy and uh so um for from us from me anyway dan all right team yeah okay care, everyone thanks a minute we'll catch you again Next week, because I think next week we've got somebody else involved in this project. It's called Max Busher. I don't know if you've heard of him. And uh, I think <laughs> we are going to have a, an MBNF 1 2. And uh, so we're really looking forward to getting the Excellent. other side of the story from uh, the wonderful, uh, charismatic, and uh, the, the, the swashbuckling Prince Charming of the world. <laughs> Mr. Max Booster. So we look Gosh, forward to uh, catching up with him next week. Everyone, thanks a million for watching us. Catch up with us again next Cheers, week. Everybody. See you again.